Hi, friends. Thank you again for joining us. This is uh, Sunil Chandy, and we are on Food for Thought, uh, the day program from, uh, sponsored by Christ Episcopal Church in Westerly. And we want to thank you for being with us and uh, connecting with us. Uh, so if you are with us and if you are uh, watching us, uh, which we are, we have, uh, have on, on several platforms, we hope that you will say something. Say, say hello. Tell us that you're watching. Help us to know that you're here and connected. And if there are any uh, questions that you might have, you might be we might be able to engage in you. Good afternoon, Ben. Thank you for producing our show. Thank you for uh, being with us, of course. And today we have a really wonderful guest, uh, a continuing guest, a guest that uh, ha always joins us probably every six to seven weeks. Good afternoon, Char uh, Charlene. Thank you uh, for being with us and thank you for connecting with us again. Um, uh, and and this uh, wonderful guest is. I'll introduce you, uh, introduce her to you again um, uh, in a in a few moments. But she's always offers us wisdom and new th new ways of thinking about the world, and uh, offers us also uh, books to read. Uh, you know, suggestions that uh, help us to to see the world in a different way. And I I really appreciated. I have appreciated her friendship. Uh, precisely because of this. Uh, she gives us so much insight. Um, this uh, today, uh, you know, as we continue, uh, you know, I, we, in this seg segment of the show, we just kind of talk about our, our food for thought from the scriptures. And the scriptures uh, in this season uh, of Easter, as we move towards Pentecost, is uh, one that's pretty powerful for us. Most of the readings that we have is the experience of uh, of the joy and, and new life and possibilities that God brings to us. And it's seen in the scriptures, whether it's Old Testament, uh, in the Psalms that we read each week, or, or even uh, in, the new in, the, in the New Testament, and then, of course, in the Gospel lessons. Uh, I did say the Old Testament, right? Right. And in the New Testament and the Gospel lesson, we, we speak mostly about... Uh, the Spirit of God uh, coming to the community of God, uh, giving them a new new sense of energy and possibility. And there's a, a dynamism that happens uh, to this community that's afraid and, and scared. And all of a sudden, uh, you find the resurrected Christ, uh, the risen Christ in the midst of that scared community. And and then there's something of a second wind that uh, that is given to this community, and then they are encouraged to go out into the world, and they do. Uh, most of the readings in the New Testament that we have, uh, other than the Gospel, of course, uh, deals with the Book of Acts, and and this uh, coming Sunday we'll be dealing with uh, Philip, the uh, one of the deacons of the early church, and how uh, he is empowered to go. To, to witness, to tell the story of Jesus, to tell the story of hope and renewal uh, to, to people who are willing to listen. Um, you know, and so it occurred to me that, uh, you know, in this community of, of Jesus, uh, which we are a part of, uh, you know, nothing really changed before, before Jesus' death and, and after Jesus' death in terms of the community, the makeup of the community. The people were the same, and and in fact, the people who who were grafted on to this community uh, became even more diverse as more people came and heard the story of Jesus and the hope of God. But the thing that, but the the composition of the original disciples, uh, post and pre uh, resurrection exper experience, doesn't really change, right? Um, and and. It occurred to me that the people don't change, uh, but their spirit does. Um, and God doesn't do anything, I mean, other than doing the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus. But in terms of the, in terms of the community, they aren't, uh, they are just given more power or energy or, or uh, you know, uh, they're giving, there's an enthusiasm that they, that they are, that they claim uh, only from their experience uh, or en encouragement from God, only from that encouragement from God, then they're able to then change and uh, address the world in a new way. And so it occurred to me that uh, 
what God does is really give us a sense of energy to face our problems and the challenges before us. Uh, the community of the disciples, uh, when uh, after Jesus died on the cross, they were uh, locked away in fear and, uh, and they were afraid to even try anything. Uh, what this spirit of God does in the resurrected Jesus, what he, the resurrected Jesus gives them the courage to lean into their problems, to lean into their uh, challenges to learn from it, to adapt to it, and then to use those challenges to proclaim the kingdom of God. And of course, that's what exactly happens with those disciples. After God comes in the midst of them in the form of Jesus, they are then going out into the Roman world, the same Roman world that persecuted them. And they use the Roman road systems, the, uh, they use the Greek language, they used uh, all of the systems that are were in place to to proclaim and witness, and then begin to change the world again um, through the power of God. I think uh, the book that that um, Deborah Royce uh, uh, has introduced us, and Deborah is our guest today, uh, was the book uh, "The Daughters of Kobani." And, and in that story, I felt that same sense of, uh, of encouragement, of leaning into the challenges by a group of, um, of women soldiers uh, who were fighting in the Kurdish army in, uh, uh, in, a, world, in a world in which uh, they were not able to fight or defend their cause. And, and yet they leaned in, they found the energy and the passion uh, and I think the spirit of God to to face the challenges before them. So I'm I'm looking forward to a conversation that uh, we're going to have in a couple of minutes, and also uh, uh, with this wonderful lady Deborah Royce, who brings us great wisdom and and uh, and great insight. Uh, Deborah is also going to hopefully she'll hopefully talk a little bit about her new book that is coming out. And I hope that we'll, we're all able to read it and connect with that book. Uh, she's just a wonderful lady. And, and so Ben, please bring uh, Deborah on board with us. Hi, Deborah. Hi. It's nice so, to see you. It's so great to have you again here. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. And you know what? Every time you come, you give me something new to think about. Um, and the last time you you came, uh, you recommended this book, The Daughters of Kobani, and I haven't finished it yet, but I find the, the book so compelling. And part of the reason is that um, it's just a it's a it's a it's a David and Goliath story in my mind. It 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 reminds me of scripture so much. It's a story of of energy and passion and 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 hope and renewal. Uh, in a world that seems so um, opposed to all of that. Yeah, I think that's very well said. <coughs> Excuse me, it's a story of, a, um, it's a deep focus on a group of women soldiers in, in the Kurdish region of Syria, who they become soldiers. I'm gonna cough again. I might have to jump up and get water. <coughs> Why don't you talk for a sec? I'm gonna, be right around the corner. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's uh you know this story uh, that we're that uh, that uh, hopefully we're going to be able to engage in is a story about this these group of women who are who become soldiers and uh, you know and 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 join the Turkish uh, Turkish uh, and Syrian army and uh, and fight for um, uh, the Turk well they they're part of the Kurdish Women's Protection Unit. Uh, the YPJ, and um, you know, and and they're fighting the same. They're fighting um, uh, ISIS. You know, the people who are who have a totally different worldview from their own. And uh, uh, Deborah, are you okay? Uh, I am. I forgot to put my water next to me, and of course, I'm fine. I know. You know, I always have a cup of coffee with me. <laughs> Normally, I do. Yeah. Yeah. 
but this this story was a real compelling story, and I really loved it. And well, I, it is in so many ways because these women are first of all they are Muslim because they're Kurds. The Kurds are slightly, you know, their own group. It is hard to understand all the nuances of people, and they're. Their philosophical leader is this guy, Abdullah Ocalan, who came under the sway of an American communist. So this freedom of women theory that they have really is very influenced by communism. This idea of, uh, you know, the, the dignity of each person. Yeah, no, I I loved it. He, you know, um, and and actually, the the idea comes from a man from New England, I think, and and from Vermont, uh, who was a communist. At, and uh, but it it was so. There's this one part of the book. Alchlan stated that the Neolithic order of a matriarchal society in which everyone was protected and people enjoyed communal party, a uh, property sharing of resources and lack of social and institutional hierarchy had given a way to a social order in which women's work became relegated to the home. Women's rights have been denied and women face what he termed the housewifeization of their contribution. And so the author, Gail Lamont, uh, writes it pretty uh, interestingly. And what he, this man was proclaiming, I think, was that in order to have a free Kurdish society, you needed to free the women. And the, uh, to to fight uh, to to be as equal as men. And I well, I think we have seen in our evolution as human beings that we've done some things right and we've gotten some things wrong, and we keep working at it. And any time we have oppressed or suppressed or repressed a, a group of of people, it it doesn't go well for us in the end. It's very hard to lead an enlightened life when you know you're not respecting the dignity of all humans. Yeah, right. And 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 what that dignity, what that all human beings can actually bring to the story of of all human history, if you suppress one group of people and. And my wife and I were talking about this the other day. We were talking about how, you know, uh, culture sometimes oppresses, uh, uh, not sometimes, it, it oppresses people, in, especially women, preventing them from being able to voice their um, intelligence, their experience, their hopes, their dreams. And then when you do that, it, it squelches their children and, and society. If you come from a point of view of scarcity mentality, and that's a new age word, a term, a lot of people don't like it, but it really defines what it is. <clears throat> if your point of view is lack, that there's only so much to go around, then you, one, we become very hoarding of whatever it is, whether it's our power or our resources. But let's, we're talking about power right now. So, yeah. If you feel that power is such a finite quality, then that is that is why human beings hold on to it because they don't want that other gender to have it, that other race to have it, that other nationality to have it. But I mean, I think that really it is not something to be hoarded. That it, I don't become less powerful as an individual if you have your own power over yourself as an individual, it takes nothing away from me. Right. I mean, it's this idea about collaboration and being able to connect with people and, and encouraging people to find their own power. And then, and then as they find their own power, they, they allow us all to be benefited, I think, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of the original ideal of the American experiment. Uh, we didn't always do it well, uh, but this idea that, you know, we have we have freedom and we have re responsibility. I think those two things are married. You, you can't have one without the other. And 
that's what we all want. We want to be able to carve out our own destiny. And that's what in, in Gail's book, she really shows us a very unusual situation in, in that part of the world where these women have such a, a strong role in uh, uh, not, a, not an avenue that is very enlightened. It's, it's the theater of war. It's violent. It's killing. But yet they're defending their land and their people. You know what? It, it's so funny. You know, have you ever, um, so I've, I've done prayers for, uh, for sports teams, right? You know, uh, you know, whether it's high school or, you know, sometimes like uh, they ask me, Father, come to, uh, say a prayer for us. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, our, our opponent is Stonington next, next, uh, next week. And we, we want you to pray for us because we want to win. Right. And of course there's somebody else on the other side, another priest on the other side who's praying for, for the victory of their, of that team too. Right. And so, you know, it, it, there was a point in the book where uh, Lamont was, was suggesting here are these women and they're, they're engaging in this work in this, this um, this this hard uh, you know work of going to war and and they have this cause and they're praying for this cause and they're and and they're and and yet the people they're also fighting who have a different worldview you know ISIS who who believe that uh, who believe in their cause right and they're both and they're praying for their cause ISIS wants to reestablish the caliphate. And and they want to suppress women and keep women down, whereas these these young women are pushing against that. And it's just it was just this really interesting. And the way Laman writes it, she didn't actually uh, diminish the power of the uh, of Is of Isis's vision in some way. She just says that this is an alternative worldview, and it was and it's clashing in this little place called Kobani. And, well, and and God is on our side, right? Whatever side you're on, God is on our side. Yeah. I think we have such a limited understanding of what the whole picture is, what's going on here. You know, we're often our prayers are are you know wish lists for what we want to satisfy something, and not always. I'm not talking about praying for you know the healing of another human being or, or the, all that stuff. But often we are praying for a wish list. And I, you know, I, I'll, I'll only speak for myself and I, I'm often very much missing the bigger picture of what might be for my greater good. And when we get to talking about my book, which is behind me, I'll tell you a funny little story exactly to that point. I think I'd love to hear that story. Let's go. Okay, so two days ago, my book, Ruby Falls, I have these big things here. I've got the book right here. <laughs> no. We had a billboard in Times Square, a gigantic billboard in Times Square. And I was able to drive in and stand under this billboard like a crazy person pointing up and take pictures of it. And it's all over social media. This billboard was at 1515 Broadway, mm -hmm. the very building 41 years ago, because I'm a woman of a certain age. I, uh, I had finished college. I was back in Detroit. While I was in college, I had danced in a major studio film and I had the chance to go to New York and audition for the same choreographer, flew to New York, dropped my bags at a friend's apartment, and went to that door, 1515 Broadway, to audition for a part I did not get. So let's talk about praying for what you want. <laughs> so I wanted that so badly. I scraped all my pennies together. I got that ticket. I got on the plane. I flew to New York. I went to that door, 1515 Broadway, audition, didn't get it. If God had said to me or a messenger of God at that time, listen, little girl, don't worry. This isn't going to work out for you. You're not going to get this. You're not going to make it as a dancer. You're going to live another 
41 years. Some things will go well, some things will go poorly. You'll win some, you'll lose some. But in 41 years, you're gonna be up on this giant billboard above this door. Come on. I would not have been able to understand it. There it is. There it is. I would not have been able to understand that. So my wish list prayer at the time, there I am. That's <laughs> I, I would have thought, you know, no, I want this. Yeah. But it wasn't meant for me. And easy for me to say now, but it would have been utterly impossible for me to understand them. You know, I love that story, and it's beautiful. I love the clip. It's it's a great clip. Of you. It shows so much joy in your in, in you. Yes. But I also I also imagine that uh, maybe that twenty year old girl, uh, little girl, uh, younger uh, woman, um, uh, being so totally so disappointed. But through that disappointment, um, you adapted. You leaned in. You you. You you faced that challenge and and then you and then you overcame it and then through the, that challenge you learned and and it succeeded in other ways and and you know these these disappointments we have um, they're important because they're part of our story of success uh, of of hope you know I agree and could you imagine how obnoxious we would all be if we never had any failure. <laughs> We would not be very interesting people. We would not be very compassionate people. I mean, think of all the things. I think of myself and just my own failures and struggles. And those are the things for me that got me to the other side. So writing now, I didn't do as much writing as a young person. I'm having this later writing career. I think I have something more valuable to say than I would have had to say as a younger person. And I'm not disparaging younger writers. Many have it all together in a way I did not. So I'm sure like I'm looking forward to reading Ruby Falls. And, I, you know, uh, you know, when I read um, Finding Mrs. Ford, I thought was I, I thought it was just it was beautiful because there were so many different layers to it. Right. And, and so it could only come from a person who's experienced many different layers in life, you know? And I'm wondering, is that the same, uh, same approach that, you know, I, am I, I'm, I'm sure I'm probably going to enjoy Ruby Falls because of the, all the depths, the, the different surfaces in, in it. I hope so. It's a very different story. This is a story of uh, trauma. A little girl is abandoned in a very shocking way at the very beginning of the book. Mm. And you, when you next see her, she's abandoned in a cave, a dark cave. And it is very traumatic. When you next see her, she has put her life together, reinvented herself. She's an actress, but she's making poor choices. She marries a man she doesn't know and uh, does not tell him about this thing that happened in her childhood. So she begins this marriage with a secret and it's kind of a Gothic structure. And I don't mean Gothic like vampires. I mean, Gothic like a Victorian Gothic novel, like, uh, uh, oh, Jane Eyre or The Woman in White or Rebecca, in okay. which you have a young and vulnerable heroine and a male figure who may or may not have her best interests in mind. So it's spooky, but it, so it deals with issues of trauma. It's a thriller on one level. So there's this kind of very tense plot line going along, but there's a deep examination of this trauma that happens to this girl and how she does or does not cope with it. Wow. Uh, it does or does not cope with it. So she has a choice of coping with it or not. Well, I don't know. Does she have a choice? I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> All right. Part of what is peeled, this onion that's peeled in the course of the book, but this thing that happens to her as a child, does she or does she not cope with it? Um, that That's what the book is about. Beautiful. I mean, I think that's uh, important for us, for us in this time period too, because, you know, uh, we are in the midst of a trauma. Too, right? I mean, COVID-19, 
um, how do we deal with uh, trauma? How do we do we run away from it? Do we lean into it? You know, uh, it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm going to lo I love reading the book. Definitely. Well, and talking about COVID-19 and the earlier subject of uh, it's a, a slight variation. You know, we know none of us are islands and we were doing so well in the U.S. right now, thank God, in our battle against COVID. But we can't we can't just take care of ourselves. I, we all know this. And looking at the situation in India right now is horrifying. So I think we're all examining what can we do as a nation? What can we do as individuals? The situation in Brazil, this is a, a really moving target. And with, with a pathogen like this, with disease, it is showing us that we can't live in a world where we just save ourselves because then we're unsavable because it will ooze in. It will just get in under the door. You know, this is a very different kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, I it's interesting that I, I, I love that part of the conversation. This morning I was talking to someone about India and how even this challenge uh, right now, because India was doing so well and then it, it uh, relaxed uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, you know, the social distancing guidelines, it relaxed the following of those uh, guidelines and, and, uh, and appropriate. And so what happened was they went through this, they're right now in the, in the most terrible situation. And, and my mother's back there right now in, in India and she's, she's in lockdown, she's safe, everything is good. Uh, but here's another good thing that's interesting that's happening through that situation. I was reading this morning that all of a sudden the uh, the border states to India, you know, like China and Pakistan. These are these are uh, these are nations that India has not had a really um, a wonderful relationship, working relationships with. I mean, Pakistan actually it was a hard divorce almost from uh, from India, and. Uh, there was great enmity between the two nations. And then of course, there's some real border issues between China and India. But right now, because of this crisis, these former enemies are now looking to help. Uh, that's, that's wonderful to hear because I have traveled in the region of China, uh, the region of India that borders China. I've traveled in Sikkim and I needed a separate visa to go yeah. into the part of India because of the border issues. Um, and of course, everything that happened with partition and all the terrible losses and pain that that so many people suffered, you know, going in opposite directions. And uh, we can only hope when these crises come along that it brings out the best in us. And I, I think you talk about choices. We all have those choices at every moment. And even if we have not always made the best choice, we can choose again. That's the beauty of a life of faith and a life of forgiveness. Every day is a new day. You know, you think about yourself as a parent and how much maybe you screwed up. I'll use I words. <laughs> how many times I wasn't patient or understanding or, or all the things you want to be when you set out to be a parent or in the world with your neighbor, with your friends, with bordering countries or, you know, no matter how many times we get it wrong, we always have another chance to get it right. And um, so I always look at it in an uplifting way, or I try to, if I ever start to feel dragged down, because I do believe um, you know, I, I, I am a person of faith, so I, so I do think there is that chance to yeah. try again. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, our Christian faith is is one of, of second chances, and I think that's what uh, draws me to it so much. And I think even those, those disciples who were locked away for fear, right, all of a sudden God comes in the midst of, midst of them and says, look, you have a chance again to do something different. And, 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 and God breathes God's breath into them so that they're enlivened to go out into the world again and try, which is, which is the, the thing that, that I always love. And that's, I think, what I loved about the Daughters of Kobani. 
I, I loved even about finding Mrs. Ford, you know, this, this young woman who uh, lost her way, but then has a second chance. I love that. I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to give too much away of that book, but, but I love that, that part of it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what comes out in Ruby Falls. Now, one thing I did want to mention, because I, 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 I love this idea. We talked a little bit before our show here was that you have a study guide uh, or a kit that can come with you. Yes. So if you go to my website, which is my name, DebraGoodrichRoyce.com, there it is. So if you go uh, to author visits or some section, just noodle around, I have the most beautiful book club kits now for both books. So you click on the book club kit and you can print it out. It's, you know, uh, bookmarks, uh, Q&A for, for book clubs. And uh, the other thing that's really fun is for both books, I've created a playlist. So there might be people who could create a better playlist than I could. Oh, yeah, just keep scrolling down. You're, you're heading in the right direction. Uh, there you go. So each book has a book club kit. Uh, and it's really fun. There, are, It's a study guide in each of them. So they're free. People can click on them, print them out. And then I do book club visits. I do Zoom. I do live. And it's it's a lot of fun to talk with readers. I think this is great because, you know, we're working with literacy volunteers here at the Christ Church. And, and I'd love to do like a book discussion about I book just, uh, discussions in general, but I, uh, but Ruby Falls would be great. If you have a study guide, it really Absolutely. makes it easy. We do, and the book will be available Tuesday, May 4th in hardcover or audio or Kindle, not paperback. That's usually about a year before it comes out. The audio book is fantastic. The I actress love that has a gorgeous voice, a uh, slightly different uh, voice from the actress who read Finding Mrs. Ford, more of a younger voice, which is more appropriate to this book. Okay, great. And then and then you said the 80s play playlist. Is yep. that? <laughs> I would love that. In Ruby Falls, uh, most of the book takes place in the 1980s in Hollywood. So there's a really fun music playlist of about 50 songs. And then Finding Mrs. Ford, half the book takes place in a 70s disco. So we've now created a 70s disco playlist for that one. So that's just kind of, you know, amusing. To I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Deborah, it's always great having you here. And and uh, and again, it's ha it's great having you in the West Shirley Stonington uh, community. And 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 uh, you and Chuck are just um, amazing people, good people, and good citizens of this community. And we, we we're grateful for your presence. And so when you're when you're back in this area, don't forget to come to our church, visit us again, and and be a part of our community too. I'll be there. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Same here. God bless you. You too. Just a wonderful lady, uh, and and filled with insight. And uh, you know, I've been really moved by the uh, a couple of the books that uh, that she's recommended. The the last being the choice, uh, which led me to read the gift, and then of course uh, this daughters of Kobani. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading Ruby Falls, and 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 I enjoyed uh, finding Mrs. Ford. Um, but more than, more than anything else, uh, Deborah offers for us on this show, offers us wonderful insights, uh, helping us to kind of lean into our own challenges of this moment. Uh, but as is our tradition, this is our time to end the program, and we usually end with a prayer. And this is the prayer attributed to, or one written by Bishop Thomas Brown of Maine. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, you traveled to towns and villages, curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. Come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. Be present with those in authority who are making hard decisions. Support the medical professionals, emergency responders, and our counselors and caregivers. We ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, go in peace to love and serve God. Spread the light of Christ to the world around you. The world needs it right now. Thanks for watching. Did you know that you can join Christ Church from anywhere in the world? If you're feeling connected to what we're doing, email us today at communicate at Christchurchwesterly.org.